March 1943. The North Atlantic has become a floating graveyard. In less than three weeks, 97 Allied merchant ships have vanished beneath the frozen waves. Half a million tons of steel, grain, and fuel swallowed by the sea. Admiral Carl Donitz and his 400 active U-boats stalked the convoy routes like predators in endless night, their packs bleeding the lifelines of Britain thin. The Allies are losing the tonnage war, and London's food reserves shrink with every passing day. Yet under those black, hostile waters, something unseen begins to change. The Germans believe they have mastered underwater detection with their GHG hydrophones, instruments that can, in ideal conditions, catch the echo of a convoy eight or ten miles away. But ideal is a word that seldom applies to the Atlantic. Storms, shifting temperatures, and turbulent layers distort the sea, rendering those sensors nearly deaf beyond a few miles. Unknown to the U-boat captains, in secret laboratories across California and Britain, physicists and engineers are redefining how the ocean itself is heard. At the University of California's Division of War Research and the Admiralty Research Laboratory, scientists approach underwater acoustics as explorers charting a hidden planet. They trace how sound travels through water, how heat, salinity and pressure twist, focus and carry vibration across impossible distances. Their discoveries create sonar systems that do more than hear, they perceive with sound. By early 1943, American destroyers begin deploying the QHB sonar, more responsive and precise than any previous device. But sensitivity alone isn't the true revolution. It's the revelation of sound propagation, the understanding that under certain oceanic conditions, sound refuses to fade. It bends and tunnels through deep channels, carrying the pulse of submarine propellers for 20 or more miles. That knowledge rewrites the rules. For years, German skippers lived by one law. Stay 10 miles from a destroyer and you are safe. That comfort has evaporated. Allied destroyers now detect U-boats at distances the Germans consider impossible, often without the submarines realizing they're being hunted. The hunters are becoming the hunted. For the first time in the war, U-boats begin vanishing without distress calls, ambushed by destroyers appearing out of empty sea. Reports pour in to Donitz's headquarters. Captains insist the enemy can hear through the ocean itself. Others mutter that their codes have been betrayed. But it isn't Enigma that's undone them. It's physics. Aboard the USS Bory, a veteran of the old four-stacker fleet, two sonar operators sit in a cramped, dim-lit compartment, headphones tight against their skulls. They listen not merely for sound, but for patterns. A submarine's propeller cavitation makes a rhythm unlike any other. Their QHB sonar filters each frequency, isolating that narrow hum between 200 and 800 hertz, the faint heartbeat of a U-boat amid the chaos of the sea. The British contribute their own marvels, the Type 144 ASDIC, blending active pulses and passive listening to triangulate an unseen target. Canadian corvettes join the effort too, learning to identify submarines by signature alone, distinguishing a Type 7 from a Type 9 by tone and cadence. These advances converge under Admiral Max Horton's Western Approaches Command, which now forms hunter-killer groups. Destroyers cease merely escorting convoys. They roam independently, responding to sonar whispers and striking with scientific precision. By spring 1943, the balance of the Atlantic War begins to shift. The Allies' hydrophones, once crude, now weave an aquatactic map of the ocean. Each ping, 
Each echo feeds back into analytical systems, predicting how submarines maneuver, dive, and die. HMS Starling and USS Bory lead this new era, their crews trained to interpret sound as language. Captain Frederick Walker's Black Swan Slopes refine coordinated attack into an art, surrounding U-boats with lethal accuracy born of long-range sonar. To German ears, it feels like sorcery. To the Allies, it is science forged into strategy. Inside U-664, Captain Adolf Greif remains unaware that he has become a subject in this new equation. His submarine drifts silently at periscope depth when the hydrophone operator catches a faint pulse, distant, steady, unimportant. Fifteen miles, he estimates. Safe. But the bearing does not change. Over the next hour, it closes. Twelve miles, then ten. Eight. The destroyer is coming straight for them. Greif orders a dive, 100 meters, then 150. The crew falls silent. The temperature drops, condensation beads along the pipes, and the hull complains under pressure. They sit motionless in the dark, convinced they've disappeared. But above them, the destroyer stays its course, unerring, relentless as though it can see through the Black Sea itself. Greif's confidence collapses. His tactics, silent running, abrupt turns, dives through thermoclines, all fail. The pursuer keeps closing, guided by a science he cannot fathom. Whispers spread through the control room, talk of cursed ships, of allied witchcraft. Then, without warning, come the first depth charges dull explosions that hammer the hull like iron fists. Dust sifts from the ceiling. Then come the nearer blasts, the Atlantic convulsing, water transformed into weapon. Panic flickers, but discipline holds. They are prey now, trapped in a steel coffin, pursued through darkness by unseen ears. The cause of their destruction lies not in luck or betrayal, but in acoustics. Allied scientists have uncovered the deep sound channel, a layer of the sea that traps and carries sound immense distances. In the cold, stratified Atlantic, submarine propeller noise travels not a few miles, but 20, even 30. The Germans never imagined such a phenomenon. Their hydrophones were tools of offense, not survival. The Allies, driven by desperation and research, turned the ocean into its own listening device. Every convoy sails now through mapped acoustic corridors that amplify sonar reach. Destroyers alter tactics with mathematical care, reducing speed to minimize propeller noise, listening through the night when temperature layers stretch sound farther. Across the Atlantic, U-boat commanders report the impossible. Being detected while submerged, attacked before surfacing, chased for hours through the depths. Captain Peter Gerlach of U-433 records in his log that the enemy possesses detection instruments of extraordinary range and clarity. His request for investigation will arrive too late. The Allies' hunter-killer groups now wield sonar data to stage ambushes. One ship holds contact Others move ahead to intercept. Hedgehog mortars fire forward, scattering contact-fused explosives that form deadly circles on the waves. Unlike depth charges, they detonate only when they strike a hull. Silence means a miss. An explosion means a kill. Chance has been replaced with precision. By late 1943, anti-submarine warfare has evolved into an industry science. Support groups sweep the Atlantic in vast sonar nets, formations covering miles of sea. Long-range detection gives destroyers time to plan, coordinate, and strike surgically. The USS England will later sink six Japanese submarines in 12 days using these same principles. It is the culmination of years of acoustic warfare, 
born in the frozen Atlantic. But in March 1943, aboard U-664, it's happening for the first time. Greif's men wait as the final depth charges fall. The hull trembles with every concussion. Lights flicker. The air thickens. Above them, the destroyer plots its last attack run. The ocean, once the submarine's silent ally, has turned against them. The hunters of the deep have become its ghosts, pursued and destroyed by their own echoes.